Okay, guys. Um, so I am going to explain why I believe that the group in Revelation 7-9 is the church. And we're just going to dig right in just so that um, I don't belabor issues. But I want to read it. And you know, first I'm going to read the traditional view, a couple of traditional views, okay? The first one is that the church is in Revelation chapter 4. Let's just read it and then we will discuss it. All right. After this, I looked. And there in heaven was an old open door. The first voice that I heard um, speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and there was a throne in heaven and someone was seated on it. The one seated there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian stone, a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surround, surrounded the throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders, dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, was also before the throne. Four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back were around the throne on each side. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the, the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will, they exist and were created. That is chapter four. <clears throat> so what I would ask is if we dear, deal fairly with what we're reading and we're not reading into the scriptures what we wanted to say, we're not taking our narrative and our uh, belief systems that we've learned from our church churches that we've been taught. I love our churches, but we can't read the rapture into what we just read. I have not read anything that sounds like a rapture to me. If I'm dealing honestly with the scriptures, I also have not read anything that is an indication to me that the church is present. What we have in heaven so far that um, John is seeing in his vision, we have the 24 elders, we have four heavenly beings, and that is it. And the thrones, the sea of glass, <clears throat> That's, that's it. That's all we have. There are There is nothing else there. Now, I know that the traditional view would take us to uh, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> and it says, after this, I looked and there in heaven was an open door. Okay? What does that mean? That doesn't mean rapture. We cannot say that's the rapture. That is a huge leap. It is a huge assumption to make, and we should not be making that assumption. That is just making making up stuff. There is nothing there that sounds like a catching away to me, to the sky, to heaven, just because the door is open, right? Um, and then it says, the first voice that I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. So... In this instance, the word like is being used, right? It's a simile. When we have like or as, and correct me if, my, if I'm not using the right terminology, but I believe simile is the right word. When we use like or as to compare something to something else, here the word like is used, meaning the voice wasn't an actual trumpet, but it's being compared to being a trumpet. Okay, sorry. I just got interrupted by my little one. All right, so it says come up here. It, when when the trumpet is being described, it, it is being compared to the sound of God's voice. There are many things that scripture uses to compare the voices to thunder, um, um, trumpet. But we, we can't somehow say this is the rapture when we can't do that. 
that that's that's a huge leap and a huge jump. And I want to deal fairly with what we're reading and take scripture for what it says. No more than that. So in my view, I don't read anything compelling in chapter four that would lead me to believe that this is the rapture of the church. We see no group. We see no multitude. And I don't see any language here that speaks of a catching up to the clouds or to the air or to the sky, anything like that. So let's not pretend like it's there when it absolutely isn't. Now, the second view, uh, and I have heard this recently, is that the, 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 it's in chapter five. And uh, it's in one particular scripture, but we're just going to read the whole thing just so we can make sure that we're not missing something, okay? Then it says, Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who was worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures in among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and a golden bowl filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands. Listen, it says, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven on earth, under the earth, on the sea and everything in them say blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. That is chapter five. Again, guys, we don't see anything about a multitude of people, anything that we can liken to the church being being um being a uh, red in in chapter five we see the 24 elders we see the four living creatures and then we see many angels thousands upon thousands that doesn't sound like a church which would be an innumerable multitude you think of all the people that would have been saved for all time since jesus this is not the church those angels are not the church Nothing else in there, right? Nothing yet. Nothing about a rapture. Did I read anything that has to do with being caught up, taken up to heaven, a multitude of group? Nothing there we read, okay? Again, let's not read in the scripture what isn't there. Now that we've gotten the true to the traditional views up, <clears throat> out of the way, I want to go to who I think is actually the church. So let's turn our attention to Revelation 7, 9, and let's read what it says. This is the group that I believe is the church. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed with white robes, with 
palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who was seated on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne. And along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, who are these in white robes and where do they come from? I said to him, sir, you know. Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat for the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of waters of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Friends, this is the church. This is describing exactly how we would expect the church to look like. It says that they are a multitude, a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, innumerable. And they're standing before the throne of the Lamb, exactly where we would expect them to be because these are Christians. Jesus is our Savior. And they're clothed in white robes with palm branches. Now we know that these robes are an actual cloth and linen outfits, right? This is glorified saints, people who are, who've been given glorified bodies and they're given palm branches. Let's remember that point, palm branches, right? And then it goes on to say that there were others standing before the throne with them. The angels that we just read in chapter five, the elders that we read in chapters four and five, and the four living creatures that were also in chapter four and five. See how the amount of people before the throne begins to increase in number. So the angels that we read in chapter five isn't the church because they are considered an addition to this multitude that we see here. They are separate groups. And then it goes on to say, that this 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 group um, came out of the great tribulation, and I have the the crossed out because I just wanted to remember to always make a point about that the word the. This has presented the biggest stumbling block to most church organizations um, in recognizing that this group is the church, because we're so focused on the idea that there is a pre-trip rapture, and there is. But the traditional view of a pre-trip rapture is wrong. It's incorrect. It's not accurate. So they refuse to allow this particular group to be the church because of this one word, the. Because the idea is that the church is not in the, the, the tribulation. And they are not. I agree with that point. But not in the traditional sense. The traditional view a calls for a seven year tribulation with the church having to be taken out before that. That is wrong. The tribulation is only three and a half years. Okay, we established that in my very first study. And if you go read that, you will find that I established that. Not only that. So in my other videos, I established that the tribulation is only three and a half years and that the church actually sees the abomination of desolation, which formally starts the tribulation regionally for Israel. And so what that means is if we see the abomination of desolation and we see the man of sin revealed, as Paul said, we would see. That means when we're taken out after that event, the tribulation has already started and we're taken out just as it kicks off. So that makes this particular passage right. We are taken out of the great tribulation right as it begins to be kicked off. And we're taken out before the tribulation begins for the nations, for the remainder of the globe, which begins at Trump one. We established that in my first study. And if you're reading this, uh, listening to this and you haven't 
seen that study, I recommend that you go back and that you read all of the uh, view all of those videos. OK. All righty. Now I am going to switch over to another book and we will read even further confirmation. And there are more scriptural confirmations here, but that's not the point of this video. Um, in another video, I'll go over more scriptural confirmations as to why Revelation 7, 9 is the church. But um, let's skip over to my Apocrypha, all right? This is the Apocrypha that I am going to be reading from. And I highly recommend if you know your Bible well, that you go ahead and get you an Apocrypha and start studying it in addition to your Bible, okay? This one has Enoch, Jasher, and Jubilees in it. I have read them all. I have read the entire book. Um, there's also um, uh, Tobit in here and some um, additional parts of Daniel and Esther. I've read all of it, okay? So now we are in 2 Ezra. all right? Ezra is just, I want to say, I believe is the Hebrew spelling of the word Ezra from our scriptures. Esdras in your Apocrypha is essentially Ezra from our Bibles, okay? And in this particular um, chapter, we're reading 2 Ezra. There's 1 and 2, and we're going to read 2 Ezra, right? And we're going to read chapter 2. Now, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, I'm not going to read all of chapter 1. I'm just going to start at chapter 2 because it. I, I, always, I just want to give you guys context, but what I really want to read is right here. But I just want to give you context so you don't think I'm pulling any any wool over your eyes, okay? And so we're going to read the context. And I'm just going to summarize a bit of what is being said before I read. So Ezra, they've been exiled, right, from the land. And Ezra has an offer with God, right? He He's complaining to God. How is it that they have been left to serve this heathen nation who has conquered their land, removed them from it, and taken taken it over? Why is it that they have to serve these heathens, right? Which are the nations. These are Gentiles, right? And these aren't Christian Gentiles. These are pagan, pagan, pagan Gentiles, pag paganers. If that's a word. They engage in paganism. Anyway, these are pagans. Sorry. And so um, he's complaining and God, and God responds to him. And he, and he does this in prayer. And God responds to him. And he says, and I think he responds to him through an angel of the Lord. But he, and he says, Hold up, Ezra. He calls him Ezra, but he says, hold up. Let me remind you of why y'all are there in the first place, right? And God is basically recounting to Ezra the sin and the idolatry of the nation and how they have not obeyed the command of the Lord and how they have not listened to God's prophets and his messengers. And he gives him, he gives him a harsh rebuke and reminder as to why they are there. And this is kind of where chapter two picks up where he is recounting the sin of Israel from the time that they left Egypt when they murmured in the wilderness, right? And God is saying, I'm sick of you people. And this is why you're here. And this is my hand by my hand and by my judgment. Okay. So let's read. This is where chapter two kind of picks off, picks up. Okay. So he says, the Lord says, I brought this people out of bondage, meaning Egypt, and I gave them my commandments at Mount Sinai, right? Um, and, and if you read along, you can see I'm interjecting my own uh, co commentary here. But it says, by my servants, the prophets, whom they would not hear, but set my counsels at nothing. The mother that bare them says to them, go your way, O my children, for I am a widow and forsaken. So who is this mother? If you know anything about your Bibles and about the personification that has been used throughout scripture, you know that the mother of Israel has always been likened to Jerusalem. And in other contexts, the temple itself has been likened to being the mother, okay? Jerusalem on earth is likened to the mother of Israel and her husband is God. He is married to the city and the land where he has put his name, the same way a husband gives a woman his last name, right? And Israel has been likened to being their children, okay? So this is the mother that is speaking in this context, right? And her children get kicked out of her and get exiled out of her. And the presence of her husband, who is God, leaves her. So she's left being widowed and barren without children, okay? So this is what she is going to be um, expressing here in, these, in, in, in this context that I'm reading. So she says... The mother that bare them says, 
to them, go your way, O my children, for I am a widow and forsaken, forsaken means left. I brought you up with gladness and with sorrow and heaviness have I lost you, for you have sinned before the Lord God and done that which is evil before me. But what will I now do to you? For I am a widow and forsaken. Go your way, O my children, and ask mercy of the Lord. As for me, O Father, I call upon you for witness over the mother of these children, because they would not keep my covenant. This is God speaking. And where it says, um, as for me, O Father, he's speaking of Ezra. I call upon you for a witness over the mother of these children, because they would not keep my covenant, which is the, the Old Testament law, that you bring them to confusion and their mother to her plunder, that there be no offspring of them. So the mother, when she was conquered, when Israel was conquered by its enemies, the city was plundered, right? And they were exiled. And all of the treasures from the temple and all of that went to their enemies, right? It says, let them be scattered abroad among the heathen. Let their names be blotted out of the earth for they have despised my covenant, right? Isn't that exactly what our scripture teach that happened to Israel? Yes, they were scattered abroad among the heathen. Now it says, whoa, here heathen just means Gentile. Let's not get too deep into that. All right. Woe to you, Asher, you that hide the unrighteous with you, O you wicked nation. Remember what I did to Sodom and Gomorrah, whose land lies in clods of pitch and heaps of ashes. Even so, I will also do to those who have not listened to me, says the Lord Almighty. The Lord says to Esdras, tell my people what I give them, tell my people that I will give them the kingdom of Jerusalem, which I would have given to Israel. I will also take their glory and give these the everlasting tabernacles. Oh, oh, okay. So wait a minute. God has switched up and he is turning his attention to another group. See, it says, he says, tell my people that I will give them the kingdom of Jerusalem, which I would have given to Israel. Who is this my people? He's referring to a whole nother group here. Okay. He's turning his attention to others. And then he says, they will have the tree of life for an ointment of sweet savor. They will neither labor nor be weary. Ask and you will receive. Pray for a few days for you that they may be shortened. The kingdom is already prepared for you watch take heaven and earth to witness take them to witness for i have given up the evil and created the good for i live says the lord now who is this group and i'm gonna tell you who i believe this group is i believe this is the the remnant the elect remnant of israel from the old testament prophets that will go into the millennial kingdom and we know this well i'll say this i believe this because it says here that they will be given the tree of life for an ointment and sweet savor. Okay. And then it says, pray for a few days that they may be shortened. Right. That means they're going to be present during the tribulation and the elect remnant is they're present during the entire three and a half year tribulation plus the time of God's wrath. All right. And then he goes on to say, mother, embrace your children. I will bring them out with gladness like a dove where it talks about like a dove. This is a reference to um, pieces that are in, I want to say either Hosea and also Song of Songs. I'm going to do a study on Hosea and Song of Songs. There are some metaphors that are in there that help us to know this is the remnant of Israel, right? All right. I won't get too deep there. I will bring them out with gladness like a dove. Establish their feet for I have chosen you, says the Lord. And I will raise those who are dead up again from their places and bring them out from their tombs. For I have known my name in them. Don't be afraid, you mother of the children, for I have chosen you. So he is giving Jerusalem comfort, saying, don't worry. You, you're not going to be left childless. I have turned my attention to these other people. And in the end of the age, they will come back to you. Okay? So now it says... Don't be afraid, you mother of the children, for I have chosen you, says the Lord, for your help. I will send my servants, Isaiah, 
and Jeremy. That is Isaiah and Jeremiah. And these were the prophets that went to Israel, right? In the Old Testament. This is how we know this isn't the church being spoken of right here. This is the remnant of Israel. And in Isaiah and Jeremiah, they focus extensively on how Jerusalem will be rebuilt, restored, how the people will return to her land after going through harsh judgment, being purged down as a nation to only a remnant and how he's going to recover the exile northern tribes and how they will come back to the land and how every tribe will be accounted for in this remnant. Not one tribe will be missed, but most of the uh, uh, Jews will be purged. They will die as apostates. All right. Uh, <clears throat> he says, so he says, for your help, I have sent my servants, Isaiah and Jeremy, after whose counsel I have sanctified and prepared for you 12 trees laden with various fruits. Now, I have some indications that these 12 trees laden with um, fruits might have uh, might be a metaphor for something else. Right. And then it says, and as many springs flowing with um, milk and honey and seven mighty mountains. We in scripture, we typically know mountains to represent kings and kingdoms. Right. And a tree bearing fruit usually is likened to a people bearing fruit, good fruit, um, good behavior, fruits of the spirit type situation. Right. Um, they're they're righteous people. When you're a good tree and you bear good fruit, um, that means you're considered righteous. And if you're a dead tree, that means you bear bad fruit and you're considered wicked. OK, so th those are things I'm still studying out. Um, and, and, it, and it may not be that I'm right, but those are things that I'm still studying out. And then he says, and seven mighty mountains were upon there grow roses and lilies. There is actually a plain in the area of Israel that is called the plain of Sharon. And the word roses of Sharon or rose of Sharon in Sharon, it's a plain where roses grow. Right. And also lilies, lily of the valley, lily. I know from Song of Songs and Hosea is a metaphor for the northern exile tribes that God promised to woo back to himself. Roses and lilies refer to people. They refer to people. And I believe they refer to the remnant that will fill um, Israel again. I will do a study on that. And that study takes us to Hosea and Song of Songs. I will do a study on that. Okay. Okay. So she says, so he says, whereupon there grow roses and lilies, whereby I will fill your children with joy. Do right to the widow, judge the fatherless, give to the poor, defend the orphan, clothe the naked, heal the broken and the weak. Laugh not a lame man to scorn, defend the maimed, and let the blind man come to the sight of my glory. Keep the old and young within your walls. Wherever you find the dead, set a sign upon them and commit them to the grave. And I will give you, what? The first place in my resurrection. This is another way that we know this is referring to the remnant because this particular piece here where he's given like all these things that they should do during this time is what they're supposed to do during the time of the tribulation. Remember, he tells them to keep he tells them to keep my commandments. Right. Well, what commandment would that be during the tribulation? He's not talking about the law, you know, at that point. No. No. They have a different set of rules that they're to abide by during the tribulation. And one of those is to remain clothed, but to remain clothed. And if you read in scripture, it, it says that you will not be found naked. To be naked is to be unrighteous. To be clothed is to be righteous. And so you're continuing, you're supposed to continue to do righteous things, even during a time of utter lawlessness and wickedness. You, they are to remain clothed. That means in righteousness, doing things that God considers to be righteous and good. And in scripture, doesn't it teach what good religion is to look after widows and orphans, right? Yes. And what do we see in these commandments? Do right to the widow and judge the fatherless. The fatherless is an orphan. Give to the poor. And it says, defend the orphan. Clothe the naked. Here, clothe the naked could be to bring people into righteousness. Because if they're naked, they're considered wicked. Or it could just be simply to clothe the naked. Heal the broken and the weak. 
laugh not a lame man to scorn, defend the maimed, and let the blind man come to the sight of my glory. That means bring him into um, wisdom and understanding of who God is. Keep the old and young within your walls. That is within the city of Jerusalem, right? Remember, the, 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 the nations and the Gentiles will trample the courtyard. They're going to trample the courtyard. And there's going to be a battle within the city. And there's going to be a stronghold within the city. I mean, they're going to be a battle between those on the outside trying to get in and then those on the inside trying to fight. All right. And they're to protect people who are vulnerable as best as they can. And whoever is killed, they are to commit them to the grave. This is what God is going to be considering as to remain clothed during this time of utter lawlessness. OK, and for doing so, they will be given the first place in his resurrection. OK, so what that also means is that the people who die, because you can only be dead in order to be resurrected, the people who die during this time. And we know many will protecting the city will die, including the two witnesses and likely likely the one hundred and forty four thousand. They will be resurrected first. That's another study that I want to do. OK, because the traditional view says that the first resurrection is for the church. Wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Scripture doesn't even say that. If we take scripture for what it said, for what it says, the first resurrection is not for the church. It is for those who have been killed and martyred during the great tribulation. I won't go deeper into that. Just go with me for right now. Stay still on my people and take your rest for the quietness for your quietness will come. Nourish your children, O oh good nurse, and establish their feet. He's talking to the city, the mother. As for the servants whom I have given you, which is Isaiah and Jeremiah, <clears throat> um, there will not one of them perish for I will require them from among your number be not careful over much for when the day of suffering and anguish comes referring to the tribulation others will weep and be sorrowful but you will be merry and have abundance the nations will envy you in order for the nations to envy you you got to be present on earth the church won't be because we'll be in heaven but they will be able to do nothing against you says the Lord my hands will cover you. They will be divinely protected during the tribulation. Many of them will be, but some will still die so that your children will not see hell. Be joyful, O you mother, who we just said is Jerusalem, with your children, for I will deliver you from um, their enemies, says the Lord, which in this instance, in this context would be the Antichrist. Remember your children that sleep, those are that are dead, for I will bring them out of the secret place of the earth and show mercy to them, for I am merciful, says the Lord. All right. So if you know anything about the the remnant of Israel and, and how they are saved, scripture says in the Old Testament, um, in the prophets, that they are saved by mercy. They're not saved by grace in Jesus Christ. The remnant isn't saved by anything of their own doing. It is by God's sheer mercy and his compassion on him and for his name's sake is what he says. And they are going to be atoned for by a spirit of judgment. So the very fact that during the tribulation, there will be another exilement, people will be exiled, people will be murdered, people, some will be protected, some will be in prison. This entire situation is going to atone for the remnant. This hell that they're going to go through is going to be their atonement and how God is going to set right their blood guilt as a nation. And after he purges them harshly, the remnant that survives will be um, atoned for and given mercy and then God's um, wrath will relent that's for another video I don't want to get too far into that but remember it's by mercy the church is saved by grace right through faith so this is another way we know this is the remnant that's being talked about in the previous uh, uh, verses that I read okay embrace your uh, children until I come and proclaim mercy to them for my wells run over and my grace will not fail I as just Received a charge from the Lord up, uh, upon the Mount Horeb, and I should go that I should go to Israel. But when I came to them, they would have none of me, and they did what? They rejected the commanded um, commandment of the Lord. And therefore, I say to you, O oh, you nations, nations means Gentiles, that hear and understand. Look for your shepherd. Who is that shepherd of the nations? That's Jesus, the Messiah. He will give you what? Everlasting rest. 
right? That's everlasting life. For he is near at hand that will come in the end of the world. When? At the end of the world. Be ready for the rewards of the kingdom. For the everlasting light will shine upon you forevermore. This everlasting light means everlasting life. You will be glorified and your body will illuminate and be splendid, right? Those white robes that you've given, they're not actually linen outfits. It is glorified saints who have been transformed into heavenly beings when they're called to heaven via the rapture, the catching away. And it says, and there is more evidence for this in the book of Enoch and in scripture for another study. Flee the shadow of this world. Receive the joyfulness of your glory. I call to witness my Savior openly. Isn't that what Christians are known for? We are known for evangelizing the world and for um, sharing Jesus openly. Oh, receive that which is given you of the Lord and be joyful, giving thanks to him that has called you to heavenly kingdoms. Not Jerusalem on earth, guys. That is incorrect teaching. The church doesn't stay on earth. We go to heavenly kingdoms in heaven. New Jerusalem is in heaven. She is our mother. She is the mother that is above. Arise up and stand. Behold the number of those that be sealed in the feast of the Lord, which I believe is the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is verified uh, by reading Jubilees chapter 16, um, 27. It's on page 259 if you have this particular Apocrypha. All right. Um, the Feast of the Lord is what we talked about. Those who withdrew them from the shadow of the world have received glorious garments of the Lord. That is glorification. Look upon your number, O Zion, and make up the reckoning of those of you that are clothed in white, which have fulfilled the law of the Lord. The number of your children whom you long for is fulfilled. Implore the power of the Lord that your people, which have been called from the beginning, may be hallowed. I, Ezra, saw upon Mount Zion a great multitude. This is Mount Zion in heaven, whom I cannot number. Oh, they're innumerable. They're considered a multitude. And they all praised the Lord with songs. And in the midst of them, there was a young man of high stature, taller than all the rest. And upon every one of their heads, he set crowns and was more exalted. I marveled greatly at this. So I asked the angel and said, what are these, my Lord? He answered and said to me, these be those who have put off the mortal clothing and put on the immortal. Right? Don't we read in the New Testament that Christians put off the mortal clothing and put on the immortal when we are glorified and raptured to heaven? This is the church and have confessed the name of God, which is Jesus, Yeshua. Now are they crowned and receive what? Palms. Then I said to the angel, what young man is he that sets crowns upon them and he gives them palms in their hands. So he answered and said to me, it is the son of God, Jesus, whom they have confessed in the world. Then began I greatly to commend those who stood so stiffly for the name of the Lord. Then the angel said to me, go your way and tell my people what manner of things and how great wonders of the Lord God you have seen. And there we go, friends, a multitude given white robes, right? Receiving palms, being crowned by the son of God. The only son of God we know to be to, to, there to be is Jesus. This is the church of Revelation 7, 9. This is the church of Revelation 7, 9, given palm branches and clothed in white. And although our scripture doesn't talk about the crowns, we know from the church of Philadelphia that you will be crowned. Also, isn't it Christians who, who confess in the world, Jesus? Yes, it is. It is. This is the church. Okay. Now, um, if you, if you go and read further, 
um, you will notice that Ezra, he starts to complain about this group. And he, he's, he's complaining to God like, okay, God, this is great and dandy. They have this great reward, but what about us? What about my people? And because Ezra does that, we know that this group isn't, isn't his people. He's still saying, what about us? After this, if you can read chapters three and four and you go on, he's like, what, what do we get? And then God goes on to explain to him the fate of his people at the end of the age. But that gives us evidence that this particular group isn't his people. These aren't Israelites. This is the church. Amen. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. Well, that's not the scriptures. That's the Apocrypha. Now, I know there has been this movement to trash the Apocrypha by a lot of our churches. Right. And I think that is dangerous ground. I think that is an absolute dangerous thing to do. And I'm going to tell you why. And you have to make your own mind up about these things. Don't let any church organization, any pastor, any leader tell you how to think. You have to think critically. Okay. Now, remember who is responsible for bringing together the individual books that we now call the Bible, the Catholic church. And most Christians, um, especially Western Christian um, organizations see the Catholic church as like the other religion and the imposter Christian religion. And this video isn't to trash Catholics. I'd have to do another video on uh, about the Catholic organization, but for the most part, a lot of Western Christian organizations don't see cat Catholicism as a true Christian, um, church. It is a church that has mixed paganism with Christianity and they are responsible for the Bible for pulling together the individual books that weren't in a Bible, but they were individual writings by Jewish men. Okay. And that same group tried to keep these particular scriptures from the masses. So much so that they murdered other Christians who tried to do so, who tried to translate the Bible into the various languages that we could actually read and who tried to disperse it. They tracked them down. They hunted them down and tried to murder them. Should we trust this compilation created by them? No, we should not. But the most important thing is this. We don't have any command in the scriptures via a prophet or a messenger of God to say, put this book together. These are the ones that go in. These are the ones that go out. And so without such a command, we have man's best guess. We have no command in scripture, no record in scripture where God tells us what goes in and what goes out where he says created in the first place. Now, this doesn't mean that the individual books themselves aren't inspired, but the compilation, the list of books that made it in, how can we say that without a doubt, these are the ones that God wanted in and the ones that weren't out or supposed to have been left out. And because of that, we can't, we can't take the apocrypha like Esdras and Enoch, for example, and say that merely because they're not in this particular book, that somehow they're not inspired by God and thus we should not read them. That is dangerous. That is completely dangerous because I believe they were left out for a reason. Remember, there's a passage in scripture that says when the Antichrist is on the scene, that truth will be thrown down. Could it be that perhaps the Bible might be banned? Maybe it'll be destroyed. Maybe we won't have access to it, right? Because we know that during that time, anything related to Jesus is going to be hunted down and purged out by the antichrist. Wouldn't that also include anything that would talk about him? Anything that we would use to share Jesus with the masses would be also attacked. This is truth. God's word is our truth, right? So if it's thrown down, what if it's not available to the masses? Well, then what would the masses have? In the book of Enoch alone, you could recreate a good portion of the Bible. Even with Esdras, you can recreate some of some of the major stories of scripture. In the animal apocalypse of Enoch, it is a complete summary of our Bibles. So even if you have maintained as a Christian a shred of knowledge of your Bible, you could go to Enoch and still use it to witness to people. 
Also, the book of Enoch, it starts out by telling us it was written to people living during the Great Tribulation, a time where the church will not be present to witness to the world. It tells us what his book is for. So it is not for our age. It is not for our dispensation. It is for the time of the end when Christians will be gone and people will be looking to and fro for truth. And if the Bible should happen to not be available, you could still, you could still use Enoch to witness to people about Jesus, even though Jesus isn't named here. He is seen in a vision by Enoch and the animal apocalypse can help you recreate a good portion of the Old Testament. Okay, so let's not tell people to stay away from something that they may need later on. We can't proclaim to know everything in God's mind. We can't do that. And we could be un unknowingly leading people astray by the only thing that might be available to lead them to God during the time of lawlessness and tribulation and his wrath. Right. This might be all people have. OK, so my suggestion is you read these books individually and, and, and make your own mind up about whether they should be read. And the way that I determine that is not just whether or not they're included in scripture because they're not. Now, listen here in history, the Apocrypha was in the Bible. It was taken out later. OK, that's for a whole nother video. But that should tell you something right there. It was good enough to be in the Bible at one point, but then later it was taken out. Ask yourself why, okay? So the one way you do that is you, you judge each book based on its own merit and you compare it to scripture and you look for contradictions. I will tell you there are none. And if you do find contradictions, I guarantee it's because your foundational teaching that you've gotten from your church or organization is probably wrong. It's probably incorrect because of church tradition. Tradition. Listen, guys, almost every single church, especially in the Western um, Hemisphere, has some parts of scripture that are just completely wrong. We can all be right. And that's how we know, <laughs> right? <laughs> With all the denominations that are out there, somebody has to be wrong. They all can't be right. That should tell us something. So if you're finding contradictions, you might want to do a self-check of what your church is, church is teaching. Because I'm telling you, there are no contradictions. There's complete harmony with Enoch and with the Bible. And if there's something that seems like a contradiction, trust me, it's something that you're not understanding properly. And let's talk about it, okay? Put it in the comment section and I'll answer, okay? All right. And one of those things primarily is the seven-year tribulation. It's not seven years. It's only three and a half years, okay? That's one thing right there, okay? And if you believe replacement um, theology, where the church replaces Israel, that's another incorrect teaching as well. That will get you the wrong interpretation as well. I will do that in a complete, another complete uh, separate video as well. Okay, guys. So if you got questions, put them in the comment section. I will be glad to answer them. Please be polite with each other in the comment section. If you have any profane words or any, you know, terrible attacking of each other, I will have to remove those particular comments. So please be friendly, if, especially if you're a Christian. You, your comments should reflect the love of God, the love of Christ with one another, all right? Okay, atheists are going to be reading these comments. They're going to be viewing these videos, and we have to represent Christ well, all right? I love you guys. Until the next video.